Oh, all right. Can tell if I have old friends. Okay. So cute. Yeah, a few more coming in. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started in one minute. So I see folks going up the stairs. And they're just like, this is the perfect vantage view. I can see people coming in. It's like when I'm teaching classes, I'm going to see who's going to come in late. <laughs> I love this. This is great. All right. There's like 40 people, so I got to wait for them. I'm sorry. Keep talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> There really is a whole crew coming. I just don't want it. Okay, they're still gonna come in, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started because it's 9.03. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. I feel like I've met so many of you already. I am Dr. G, the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. For the 95th time, welcome to WashU. <laughs> so I do was asked to make an announcement. If there is any student here who is a transfer student or from the class of 2027, you're in the wrong room. You're supposed to be at a mandatory event, so if you're also watching this live stream, so if any of you are here, um, please go ahead and go to that room. And parents, I'm sure some of you are already getting your phones out, texting them to say, are you awake and are you at that mandatory event right now? It's fine. Help us out. All right. So I, I want you to know that um, we are all here, and we've said it so many times, to help your students as they transition into this new world of college. And so this session is called Parents as Partners because we are here to partner with all of you and you and their families to make sure that they succeed through their time at WashU. If you're watching this from live stream, hello, and I hope that um, you will also be able to participate by going ahead to go on this QR code as you think of any questions that you want to ask. I know that our students and staff are also giving out paper as well, so if you have questions to ask, go ahead and fill that out, and later on we will collect it, and we'll be asking those questions um, with the panel. Um, I just want to do a little, because we're in student affairs, I want to do a little kind of seeing who's in the room, a little icebreaker, if you will. So first of all, who is here? Raise your hand if you're able to, or do a whoop whoop if you're from the East Coast. <laughs> I like that. All right, if you're from the best, I mean the West Coast. <laughs> I know, I love it. And I, I hope that there's no major damages from all of those the, the storms, we don't do well with, um, with water in the West Coast, especially Californians, so hopefully nothing happens. All right, how about the Midwest? Our Midwest folks. From the South? Folks from the South? Yay! <laughs> All right, how about Alaska, Guam, Puerto Rico? And our territories? No, nope, no, nope. I, I know we have students from there, by the way. Um, international families and parents? Yay! You came so far. Um, and I want to do a special acknowledgement for the families. I know we do have them from Hawaii. If you can raise your hand. I hope that you weren't um, too affected by what's happening uh, with, with Maui and our house. hearts go to you and the states and, um, and all your families and our students from there. So now before we begin this fantastic panel discussion, I would like to introduce our Chancellor, Chancellor Andrew D. Martin. 
So he has a long list of accolades and accomplishments, but I want to tell you that what we are so lucky at this campus, this is my 31st year as working professionally in higher education, my fifth institution, and he is my best boss in terms of a chancellor or president that I ever worked at. And I'm not saying that because he's sitting right there to my right. I, he is there with your students. If you walk around here, returning students will actually want to stop him and take pictures with him and introduce themselves and talk with our chancellor. So I can say all the great things that he has done and continues to do as an administrator and a scholar, but I want to tell you that he does, as a chancellor, try to get to know our student community and advocates for them, and he truly is the one that is leading our campus, create, helps create the best in class student experience for your your student. And so with that, I'd like to invite the Chancellor to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. G, for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you to the outstanding WashU staff uh, who've been eagerly preparing all summer uh, for this momentous week. Let's let them know their work is so very appreciated. Class of 2027, parents and families, welcome uh, to WashU. Uh, we are so excited to meet your students, the most diverse and accomplished first year class in WashU's history. I know you must be so very proud and excited for your student, not only that they made it here, but they are now part of a community of peers who will challenge them, commiserate with them, love them, and walk alongside them during the special time in their lives. In the next four years, they will build bonds that will enrich the remainder of their lives. The class of 2027 is the most economically diverse in WashU's history too, and has the most students who identify as people of color. How lucky we are to learn among such a wide array of people with rich experiences and valuable perspectives to share. Families, I am so grateful for the privilege of spending this time with you today. First, I want to thank you for your manual labor moving your students into their new homes. If you survived move-in day in the St. Louis weather, you're ready for your next Herculean task. And I'm not talking about saying final goodbyes. I mean you're ready to brave the world's most harrowing target parking lot for those last minute room essentials. Trust me, if you can survive that target parking lot, you can handle the next four years. Thank you for raising this intelligent, thoughtful, inquisitive, resourceful, creative bunch of young people. Truly, we are so impressed. I know that each of you has sacrificed much to reach this milestone. Maybe you traded vacations to afford music lessons, or technology camp, or club sports. Maybe you held them on your lap and read Goodnight Moon what felt like a thousand times. And your child is here today to write their own story. The tutors, the late nights, study snacks, the helping hands, the tough love, it all meant something. It all meant that today, you and your child are joining this WashU family a family that will strive to nurture your child intellectually, professionally, and as a responsible citizen of a global society working toward making the world a better place. We honor your role in raising your student, and we thank you for entrusting their education to us here at WashU. And speaking of trust, I want to encourage you to think about how you will demonstrate your trust in the years ahead. My wife Stephanie and I have a daughter in the ninth grade, and looking ahead to when I'll sit in your seat, it's hard to imagine that she'll be ready to handle some of the basics of her own life. Will she remember to eat her veggies, go to bed when she's tired, or know how to separate her whites from her colors if we aren't there to remind her? Probably not, but when she goes to college, it will be time for us to let her learn. 
because honestly, a basketful of shrunken sweaters and newly pink socks goes a long way to show our students that we trust them. It may sound silly, but what your student really wants from you right now is not your services as a hands-on parent, but to know that you will trust them to find their own way and to recover from their mistakes without your help. Maybe that can be your code word, moms and dads. When you're tempted to step in too soon, take a deep breath and ask each other whether your child is having a true problem or simply a pink sock moment. That said, they also need to know you're still on the other end of the line when they call. Not to fix things, maybe not to even offer advice, but to listen, to offer words of support and encouragement, to keep them connected to the traditions of home in some capacity. When they know they are still supported from afar, they will develop the confidence to explore their unique individual passions and interests. And that's certainly what they'll do, and it's an important part of their time here. I'll tell you today that some of you are going to eventually be getting the call, not about laundry. The call I'm talking about is when your pre-med science whiz calls home to ponder a switch to art history, or when your sensitive poet calls home to announce a switch to computer science. Families take these calls as good news. Your student will be poised for a life of success and service if they are in love with what they're learning. Let them have this time of exploration and be amazed how many they manage to fit all of the pieces together to make a meaningful life. In conclusion, I hope the days ahead go smoothly and that you enjoy these memorable moment, moments. We are always happy to take your calls, our emails, or texts should you want to talk because you too are part of the WashU family. Thank you again for being here with us this morning. I love that. And in my 31st year working in higher ed, I have to say that um, I've seen those pink sock moments quite literally from your students as they try to figure out how to do laundry. So it's, it's awesome. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, so now this session, Parents as Partners, and I love the title of this because at Wash U, what we don't do is we don't shut the doors to our families. We acknowledge that our students comes to all of us with all of you in their backpacks and their luggage and in all the U-Hauls that we saw moving in with them. Um, so I want to say, and, and you're going to really hear from my colleagues here, but at WashU, you'll hear some folks and some students talk about their why WashU. And so why and purpose is so important for us as we understand your students' names and stories. And so for student affairs and this division, our why is your student. There's no other why for us. It is about the students that we have the honor of working with over the next four years. And so for us, I like to think of this work as being hopeful and hope-filled because your students and why we do this work represents the hope that we have for this next generation to be the leaders and do a great job and fix the stuff that maybe my generation and other generations have not done so well. That they are our hope. And because of that, we take this job seriously and we care. So when I first became a dean, um, I had other jobs, but dean of students, my mom who didn't really know what I did told me at this party, and if you ever met my mom and some of my staff did, she's a little bit dramatic and she has lots of stories, um, but she said, please don't take away other people's children the way your school took you away from us. And I'm a first generation college student, so the very first one to leave. And the hurt that she felt 
when my alma mater, who I love, which I loved, took me away from her and did not communicate and really kind of shut the doors from her perspective and I changed and she didn't understand all of these changes is something that informed me in my work. Your students will be here and maybe some of them will even have the opportunity to study abroad and do great other great things. And you will physically not be here a lot, but we understand that our job is to make sure that we prepare them to go back and be out there and be in the world, always with you being a part of that. You can't spend a night here in, in our res halls. <laughs> you can eat here periodically. We have great spots to eat. And you can visit and we, we invite you to come back. But trust me that you have a vice chancellor of student affairs and you have a team of folks who know that our job is not to wrestle them away from you, but rather to ex have them explore and grow and see who they are, always to go back and be with their families. And so with that, speaking of families, this is our Bear family, our WashU family. I have the great pleasure of working with really terrific staff members from the Division of Student Affairs, over 400 and only six represented up here who lead these many areas. Before I introduce them, I want to acknowledge our newest staff member, our newest Associate Vice Chancellor. She hasn't quite started yet, but wanted to see how move-in works. And it's Norma Guerra Gayer, who is our new Associate Vice Chancellor for the Center for Career. Welcome, Norma. And so now I'd like to ask each um, person that I'm gonna, if you can actually, before I ask the question, say briefly your name, um, areas that you oversee, and how long you've been at WashU. And we're gonna start with our Dean of Students, Associate Vice Chancellor, and Chief of Staff to the Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Rob Wild. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Chancellor Martin. My name is Rob Wild. I'm an Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Um, I have been at the university uh, for a really long time. Uh, tw this is the start of my 25th year working here, and I attended Washington University as an undergraduate. Um, the areas that I work with, I work with our student media, I work with uh, the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards, the Office of Scholar Programs, and Campus Life. Thank you. We'll do the applause at the end. <laughs> Hello all, I'm Danny Pape, director of the newly named Center for Career Engagement. I've been here for one year and I'm a St. Louis native. Hello, my name is Mark Garmimura Jimenez. I over, I'm one of the associate vice chancellors here as well. And I oversee the Taylor Family Center for Student Success which uh, really supports our first gen and limited income students. And then I also oversee the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, which has five offices that support our LGBT students, our Dialogue Across Difference Program, international students, uh, interfaith students. And uh, I'm, I'm from Southern California, from that other coast. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Cheryl Mauricio, Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, overseeing the offices of residential life and student transitions and family programs, which all include summer conferences, faculty fellows, and family programs for the orientation that you have this morning. Welcome. And I'm from Hawaii. Good morning. I'm Anthony Asma, Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and the Director of Athletics. I also oversee recreation, uh, intramural sports, club sports. Uh, starting my seventh year, and I'm from the great state of Florida. You say that like you're hesitant there, Anthony. I don't know. <laughs> he, the other one worked in Florida, too, by the way. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kirk Dewar. I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Well-Being, and let me add my welcome to your uh, attendance here at WashU. Um, he, him pronouns, and I oversee all of the student-facing health and wellness services uh, that your, your students get, so our counseling, our health, disability resources, WashU Cares, um, and a number of others that we have, and we're really excited to be able to have you with us today, and I've been here for about four years. Great, thank you. All right, now we can clap for all of them. <laughs> so the first question goes to our, our newer 
person in this panel. Of course, we do this. It's, it's you know, it's fine. He's ready. Um, so, Danny, I heard uh, families were already starting to talk about the Career Center and our newly named Center for Career Engagement, or as I call it, CCE. Can you talk a little bit about this new program or process that we are calling Career Communities and explain what that means? Yes, I get really excited about this, and I hope you all find uh, excitement in it as well. So, career communities are industry-aligned learning communities that provide opportunities for students to explore their skills, values, and interests. They, gain, they can gain valuable industry knowledge and build key connections with career coaches, professionals, and mentors. This model is really was explicitly built for WashU students. Our students are so interdisciplinary in how they go about their education uh, and to get better equitably get support for the types of industries they want. No matter your major or study, you have an opportunity to go into a variety of fields. So, a couple of important things that will be engaged in these communities. One is on-demand content. When our students want content at two in the morning, they want to be able to get the answers to the career questions that they have. It doesn't matter what time it is. So we need to build content that's going to uh, deliver those answers. Virtual and in-person programming. Peer coaching. Having current students engage with your incoming students is really valuable. Student club engagement. As you know, there's over 450 clubs that Rob oversees um, that, that are really trying to get key industry knowledge for, for several of them. And then we'll also do career treks to local, national, uh, and, and regional um, uh, companies uh, where our students want to go and where they want to go work. We have alumni all over this country doing great work, and we want to engage them in their career development. So all that to say, Career Communities is going to be a way for all students to have access to the type of career support they want and need. Um, and we, as the CCE, are going to provide that through um, very specialized programming and, um, uh, and, and industry information. Thanks, Danny. And also, um, this year, we're going to contact your students got to hang tight a little bit, they're going to get a contact from their career coach. It's a new program that we're doing where every first year student will get a personalized hello from the CCE to start inviting them to explore their careers and interests and talking about internships and research. So more to come on that. So thank you, Danny, for being a partner in crime this past year in making all of these changes. So the next one is Cheryl, and these questions were cultivated as over the next, last few days as we've been talking with families. Um, if my student has a difficult situation with their roommate, what options do they have, and are there opportunities to change their rooming or their res hall or their suite mates? Thank you, Dr. G. I was so excited to welcome you. I forgot to say that I've been here for five and a half years. So I was like, man, I missed the question here. Uh, but good morning. Most of you I've met uh, over the last couple of days. And this is an interesting question because you'll probably get a phone call from your child to say, I, I had a hard conversation. I disagreed with someone. I, I don't know what to do. And in, in the context of what was shared earlier through Chancellor Martin and Dr. G, is that we're hopeful that your child will be with us at WashU to learn about difference and to be able to engage about difference. And there, there is a, a fine line between, am I hearing from my child that they are in danger and that they are unsafe? Did they get hurt? And, and that is an issue that my team is ready to attend to when needed. So I, I want you to know that when those emergencies come your way, we have a significant support system at WashU where we'll embrace them to help them solve that, solve that situation. The piece that we're talking about here is really, you know, my roommate doesn't wash their clothes. They don't clean their side of, of the room. Uh, they play music at 3 a.m. and I really need to sleep. Well, we are prepared to have conversations with your child. We don't jump right into a room change request. Uh, we don't move them around very quickly. So there's a couple of things that I want you to share that they'll be experiencing over the next couple of days. They've attended a mandatory floor meeting that they had on the day that they moved in, understanding community standards, what to expect from the community. And, and our staff is also going to meet with your students 
to have a conversation about roommate agreements and community agreements in order to facilitate a discussion of preferences. Uh, my team has worked really hard in taking the housing applications to be able to pair them up as best as we can. But these conversations help facilitate some dialogue that they nev may never have experienced before. So we're hoping that that will flush things out. We also then have a room change request portal. So if after the discussions with you and our staff, they feel like this just isn't the right fit, uh, we encourage them to do a room change request. We don't do room switches in the first two weeks because we all know that some things come up very quickly and if your student is quick to change, we really aren't giving them opportunity to experience and have a conversation with, with our community. And after the two weeks, if we find that they have a change request form, we don't change the room automatically. This past year, we've introduced a system where we have some level of facilitation about the concerns that the students have and what you'll find is that our room change requests have decreased significantly. The amount of room changes that we did last year was much less than we've seen. And so when they, when they call you uh, to Chancellor Martin's point and says, I really don't like my roommate, I can't be here, I don't want to, I do encourage you to have a conversation with them about what it is and help them through the process. And on our end, we're, we're ready to support them. And also emailing me about the room change, I just give them that link. I will give you that link on how that all works, but I can't really make any room changes either. So <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. So for Kirk Dewar, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna switch. So what advice do you have for students first coming in about how to develop healthy lifestyle? What is WashU's overall approach to student physical and emotional well-being? Thank you, Dr. G. So uh, your students uh, are here not by happenstance. And I think you remember the day that they opened their letter of acceptance to Wash U and how they were excited about it. And they think about it in a couple of different ways. So intellectually, they understand that they are uh, admitted to Wash U, but emotionally sometimes they feel like that they might be allowed in. And I want to reassure you that they were chosen to be here. And there's a difference between that and, and just being allowed to be in. Part of what we want to help our students to be able to develop while they're here is a sense of well-being. And many of our students are used to being the most academically outstanding performer of their class, their high school, and yet they arrive here and find that many others are as well. So as they get here, part of our agenda is to help them to understand who they are, the expertise that they bring, and the knowledge that they can develop. And for me, this allows Better? Yes. Better. All right, so we're trying to be able to help them to develop um, an emotional side. So we know uh, psychologically that this, part, this uh, time of individuation where they separate from you, this growth and development that they're going through um, on, a, on a psychological level is really important to be able to do. So in a nutshell, our goal is to be able to help your student leave the university with better well-being than when they were admitted. So that's, that's our simple goal to try and be able to do that. It's super complex because there's a number of things that go into that. And at a really basic level, um, some of the things that I would offer to you are the same things that I would offer to your students. And that is eating, sleeping, and exercise. And nobody's going to take notes on those to be able to remember them because we're all aware of them. And some of you are good at one of them. Some of you are good at two of them. And almost none of us are good at all three of them, right? And for our students, they become surprised how much what they take into their bodies can impact them because usually they're throwing something into their backpack with a shelf life as old as they are. And they're going out into the world trying to be able to survive on that. And they don't recognize how important the food that they eat and especially don't recognize how important the sleep that they get is. So our goal here is to try and provide opportunities and experiences and discussions with your students to help them to be able to develop that other side that non-intellectual side, that emotional side, that self-care side, and those pieces where they can learn to be able to navigate the world on their own and hopefully implement some of those things that you've already taught and trained them to be able to do. So trust that we are working diligently in, in your students' best interest, trying to be able to help serve them. Trust your training that you've given to them, that that will kick in. And by the way, parents, we often think that when students get to college that they listen to their uh, their student colleagues more than they listen to anybody else and they listen to them a great deal But research continues to show that the ones that have the greatest influence on them is still you Despite the fact that they might not be in moment-to-moment -moment contact with you So 
our goal is to try and help them leave here happier and more well adjusted than when they arrived. Thank you. So we have, we've been really putting as part of our initiatives and our strategic plan, the term healthy excellence. And so I'd love to now, it, I love that they're sitting next to each other, um, ask Anthony Asma to talk a little bit about healthy excellence and also talk about how do students, how can students best engage with our Summers Recreation Center? So Anthony, do you mind talking a little bit about that more? Yeah, awesome. Uh, to reiterate what Kirk said, I, I think it's important that um, these students prioritize their health and well-being and really prioritize healthy habits. Um, secondly, Summers Rec is more than a gym, a pool, and weights. Um, we like to reference it as a place for our young people to connect, find community, and just have fun, a place where they can decompress from the academic rigor. Uh, I have to list the uh, offerings that we have. Um, and ones that I think might surprise you. First of all, we have 60 fitness classes per week, which Dr. G models the way. She's going to a couple. That's not why I'm injured. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, outdoor trips, everything from canoeing and hiking and things of that nature. Intramural sports leagues, different levels of participation as well as co-ed. Uh, even personal trainers, and I've, I've actually utilized that uh, a couple of times. My wife wants me to take on more of the cooking classes, but they fill up quick. So we do teach people how to cook. <laughs> but this one, which I think is really important, because I do think mindfulness is, is just as important as eating right and, and having healthy habits. Uh, we have massage chairs. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. <laughs> But lastly, last year, we had 11,000 different unique student visits. That doesn't mean me going twice, count it twice. Uh, I think that speaks well, not only to the campus, as far as having undergrads, but having grad students. And we have a high percentage of faculty and staff who are, off the, who are also members, which I think that's important for students to see us modeling the way, uh, as I alluded to with Dr. G. Um, one thing. If you can remember today, and remember my uh, little uh, three minutes, um, your child has exclusive access. It's only open the first years this Friday. We call it Night at the Rec. I think it's bigger than them knowing the classes and all that and see me struggling running around the track. Um, it's also a chance for them to really get to know not just their corridor, but also this incoming class in a unique way that uh, I believe that the rec center is one of the few places that doesn't matter what you major in, whether you're Greek or not Greek, your zip code, it's just a place where we can connect, decompress, and really try to create an environment for young people to have fun. I have the key to happiness right here. <laughs> you can see it on the website, it's our playbook, and it just lists out everything from uh, log rolling, which is the one thing I have not tried yet, I have to be honest with that. Um, to uh, cooking classes and we really try to make an environment to meet young people where they're at and get them to make this a part of their college experience not just what happens in four walls of a classroom but also um, kind of stretching your comfort zone a little bit while also leaving some of the stress in the rearview mirror. Thank you, Anthony. What I like about encouraging students to go there is that when they go there they're ending up socializing working out, I see more socializing than working out sometimes, but they, they, they leave their backpacks in lockers, they leave their books, they're not kind of getting into the stress of their homework, it's a place for them to decompress. And so it's just another great place for them to engage with their peers or have their own moment to themselves, that's just, just amazing and part of community with their staff there to also look out for them as well. So really, really love that place. All right, now we're gonna switch to uh, Dr. KJ or Mark. A lot of families have been asking me that they want their students, and students too, that they want their students to meet others and understand individuals who are from different parts of the world or have different ideas than them. How do we do that here at Wash U, where at the same time, they're a little worried about what's happening in terms of cancel culture. What kind of ways are you uh, looking at? What kind of things are we doing that really promotes the concept of diversity and dialogue at Wash U? 
Thank you. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I uh, was on a diverse democracy project. We were looking at how students interacted with each other on college campuses uh, from different backgrounds. And what we found is when we looked at one of the areas we looked at was our themes was social awareness. And when we looked at that, the biggest impact around social awareness was their pre-college experience. So I look to all of you as the responsible part. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, I think there's a few things there that are important. One is that, you know, we send our students off to college and we think they're going to become this whole different person. Some of them will be, they will be different, but that they haven't lost or will not have the influences of the experiences that they had before they came here. What you have instilled in them, the things you've exposed them to, will influence how they see the world, how they interact with each other. So when I think about that, I think about the fact that we're an institution of learning. We're not an institution of knowing. They didn't come here already knowing everything, otherwise they wouldn't be here, right? They're here to learn, to think about difference uh, from each other. And actually, uh, I was thinking about this earlier, and I put it, I screenshotted it is um, there's a, a faculty member, one of my alma maters, and, and she says, we must be forgiving of each other because we are all learning from each other. We struggle with and offend each other because we don't know each other. And I think the big piece with that is that here, we want them to get to know each other, and we want them to be a little bit more forgiving of each other, and that means that we have to give them tools. So at WashU, one of the things that we're doing this fall, we've launched, is a one-credit course called Dialogue Across Difference, or DXD. And in this class, they will, it's, it's only half a semester, you know, one credit's not a lot of, um, the expectations are big because of the participation we expect, but uh, it's something they can easily add into their schedule and get the tools to think about how they can dialogue with each other. In this class, they'll talk about race, gender, politics. I actually taught the pilot on politics this past year. And what we saw was that every single student that went through this class had a shift towards understand, wanting to understand others more, wanting to engage with their classmates more, wanting to understand why others thought about the, way, thought about the world the way they do and how that may be different than the way they understand the world. And so this is something that we've, we actually have a, a whole set of trainers uh, or trained facilitators across student affairs. And uh, we're integrating this type of intergroup dialogue into a lot of the different spaces that your students will participate in as student leaders and, and in student organizations. But I really encourage you to think about them and engaging in that class. This is important to us. I think it's important to the future of our democracy, that we are getting our students to think about their roles that they will play, both not on this campus, but in the communities that they will lead. Thank you, Mark. And the last question for now for this panel that we have is for Rob. So Rob, can you talk a little bit about some programs in which students um, can learn about leadership opportunities and how can they get engaged with that? And anything that you want to say that's possibly unique at WashU when it comes to leadership? Yes, thank you. And I just want to start by saying your students are entering Washington University in the fall of 2023 at a great time when it comes to leadership programming at WashU. Uh, both Chancellor Martin and Dr. Gonzalez have really committed to the idea of creating more formal pathways for students to become stronger leaders during their four undergraduate years here. So what does that look like? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, for, first of all, we know that all of your students, uh, as they come into the university, have experiences with leadership. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. Uh, they, they are, there's something about them uh, that we have seen through our admissions process that, that shows that they have uh, a foundation when it comes to leadership. For us here, we want to then uh, take that foundation and provide them with a pathway to become even stronger leaders during their time here. 
And what is unique about WashU when it comes to that? Uh, a couple of things. One thing is we really are committed to this idea that we want every student to develop their own uh, sense of purpose. Uh, Anna uh, talks a little bit about a student's why. This is a little bit more um, a, of a sense of what, it, what is it about your background and your values? What skills do you have? Where are your strengths? And what is your purpose when it comes to being a leader? The other thing that we talk about when we talk about leadership is we talk about the idea that you don't have to be the president of an organization to be a leader, even though there's lots of opportunities here to be presidents of student organizations. We know that leadership happens at all levels. Uh, it happens uh, on, on uh, floors in the residence halls. It happens on our athletic teams. It happens in our clubs and organizations. And we want to make sure that every student understands that they have the potential to lead from wherever they sit. Um, one date I want you to think about as you are uh, saying your goodbyes to your student in the next 48 hours, and that is next, well not next Friday, two Fridays from now, on Friday, September 1st, uh, in the field behind you, outside in Mud Field near the Danforth University Center, we have our annual fall activities fair, and that is where all 450 and more student groups will set up shop uh, in a huge fair uh, of, of uh, involvement to get students to sign up for their groups. And I encourage, we encourage every student to attend. Um, we, we know that most of our undergraduates, the majority of our undergraduates during their four years are engaged in uh, two or more of our student groups. And uh, what those are, I hope they don't know yet, uh, and I hope that they go to the activities fair with an open mind and decide maybe it is the beekeeping club, or maybe it is sailing. Yes, we do have a sailing club here in St. Louis. Uh, and, and that they find the thing that is of interest to them. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I found out yesterday, I was reminded by a colleague that we have a butter churning club, so I'm gonna check that out myself. They might need an advisor. Um, so we have some live questions now from folks, so keep putting that through the QR code because we're reading it. Um, the first one will be to Kirk. Kirk, will you or someone from your staff contact us if our student is experiencing health issues or emergencies? And also, is there something in which they should, families should do or students should do now in terms of signing a paperwork to release their medical information to them? So thank you, and a, and a great question, especially as I mentioned earlier, as your students move from uh, sort of being under your wing in your house, having daily contact with them to move outside. Um, I was, uh, watched a panel of students one time, and a parent from the back row was asking somewhat of a similar question, but that initially began with, how often you know, do students contact and talk to their mom and dad? And this was a student panel, and the student responded by saying yes. I talk to them all the time, and the mom being a wily veteran of more than one college student said, how often is all the time? And he said, all the time. We talk like every month. <laughs> <laughs> so, so be aware of a couple things. Your student's preference for engaging with you might shift a little bit, and don't let that allow itself to wheedle in in the back of your mind and, and assume that that reflects on poor parenting skills. It just doesn't. However, they are going through this process where they are doing things on their own, but rest assured that my team, and I have several areas that work very closely with your students. If they're having a health issue, certainly my uh, Habit Health and Wellness Office, if they're having a mental health issue, our Counseling Psychological Services Office work with them. But we also have assistant skills and development uh, folks working in WashU Cares who help transition those students to the care that they need. But if there is an emergency, one, make sure that your students, um, with both with ResLife and with our Hab of Health and Wellness, have your name as their emergency contact. And if something should go sideways to where they're not able to contact you, even if they've not yet, even if they've reached the age of majority, I work very closely with my counterpart who has a similar haircut as I do down on the other end of this um, <laughs> this row here. And and notifications do go out to parents when there's an emergency. But also, as they move into this adulthood stage through some of those services that I just mentioned, they have the ability to be able to limit what you get to know. So if they're an adult and they're going into uh, counseling, they can literally sign a release form that says, you can talk to my mom about my grades, my dad about my dating, but neither one should know the other thing, <laughs> right? They don't ever do that, but they have the capacity to. You, there are uh, 
FERPA forms that allow you to have access to their uh, health rec or excuse me, their academic records. And there are also some HIPAA forms that allow you to have access to their health information. Those uh, HIPAA records, however, we'd encourage those students to sign those forms at the time of service. So it's not something you need to do today. And in fact, m uh, our counselors and our um, uh, medical providers offer that to the students when they come in because we do want to have contact with you. We do want to be able to keep you informed, but we're also going to respect the rights uh, of your student to be able to maintain what they need to maintain in order to be able to seek those services. So again, it's a bit of a challenge as they go through this process to be able to do that. But rest assured, if there's a medical or other emergency, we work with the Dean of Students Office in Washu Cares to make sure you get notified. Thank you, Kirk. And since you mentioned the other F word, uh, FERPA, uh, Dean Wild, Rob, can you talk a little bit more about that? And can you talk about what happens? Will you notify families if they're doing well academically or not so well if they're missing classes and all of that? Yep, so FERPA, I, I know you're all so excited about FERPA. It's the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. You can Google it. Um, what that basically says is that once your student turns 18, we are not uh, l going to share information with you uh, w about their academic record. Um, and we're, we're serious about that. And I think, I think back to the Chancellor's uh, comments about the pink sock moment. This really, in all seriousness, we want you to think about your, your students turning 18 and being adults. We want them to have that privacy uh, with, their, with their academic records. This is a conversation that you all should be having with them. Um, and and hope, hopefully they will be open with you about how they are doing or how they're uh, performing academically, but we are not, un unlike high school, we're not sending report cards home or sending emails home. Um, I think this will be talked about in the school sessions that you'll go to next, but each of the uh, schools that students are enrolled in here um, have, have processes when a student is struggling academically to work with that student, um, and often those notifications are sent home uh, via mail, so you may be aware of that. But I encourage you to, to really have a conversation with your student before the end of December about how you want to be in communication about grades. I will say back to uh, what uh, Dr. Dewar was saying a, a moment ago, uh, he and I work very closely together. Again, we, we want to make sure our families are aware when a student is in crisis, either uh, academically or uh, with some other health crisis, and we will uh, sometimes make the decision to call home, but we, we more likely than not will let your student try to work through a challenge, and in that conversation, we're asking them uh, if they have uh, spoken to their families um, about that. Thank you. All right, the next question is to Danny. Danny, we've seen different signs on campus, um, and so we're a little confused. What's the difference between the Center for Career Engagement, the Career Center, and the Weston Career Center in the Olin Business School? Yes. So we went through a process over the last couple of years to unify career services. And this is an opportunity to more equitably serve all students on campus, so we get really excited. So we are now one large operation, the Center for Career Engagement. Now we do have physical locations all across campus because we want to be where students are. We want to serve them and engage with them where they feel most comfortable. So the Weston Career Center space in the Olin Business School is still run by the Center for Career Engagement. Um, and, and all students can go in and access those services. We have locations in the Danforth University Center, the Brown School, uh, the McKelvey School, and down at Sam Fox um, School of Art and Architecture. So we are there to support all students. So just know that if a student has a question, please have them call the Center for Career Engagement or email, and it'll all go to one place, and they will get uh, the direct answer and best answer for how to best support them. So we get really excited about serving these students more equitably. And any major can go to any of those areas. And so, and the, the brandings are happening and they'll see new signs pretty soon. I think week one of school is they'll see that one name for all of these um, satellite locations. But great question. So Mark, can you talk a little bit more about Center for Diversity and Inclusion? We saw the names, we saw some events happening. What does it do and is it open for all students? Sure, so the CDI, or that's what our students would say, the CDI, Center for Diversity and Inclusion, it's in the first floor of the duck, 
and um, it is a so we have kind of redesigned this uh, this center to be the home to these different offices. So it is a home for all students, uh, but we do highlight and support students who have affinity with different um, different identities within their experience. So. Uh, one of the offices is for our LGBTQIA students, and that is our Spectrum office. And so this, you know, creates an opportunity for students to connect to each other, but also to resources uh, on our campus and our community. We have the Office of Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life. Uh, our students come here with uh, the need to connect with their faith communities. We have students who are not connected to faith communities that want to explore spirituality or have ethical questions that they want to grapple with, they uh, participate in programming there. And one of the big things that we do is something called pause, that and they'll do pause at Graham, so they'll come in here, and it's time for reflection. There's also like arts and crafts in the back sometimes, uh, and then food out, out in, the, um, in the patio. We have a new office called uh, the Office of International Student Engagement. It's, its home is over here in the women's building, and that's really uh, a new space for us to, to create programs for our international students who are not just trying to connect with each other, but also to connect with the United States, like the culture, cultural differences here, Missouri, St. Louis, but also uh, find ways to find um, connections with, e with our students from the United States. Um, we have and then DXD, so I talked to you a little bit about that, the course uh, that we have uh, that's run through that, that new office. And then uh, we have another office that we've kind of uh, translated some of the previous programming that we were doing in the CDI to the Cross-Cultural Connections office. And that space is to, you know, throughout the year there are heritage months, cultural weeks, uh, students have come from different backgrounds and so that office will help uh, celebrate uh, student communities and cultures throughout the year, but also an opportunity for students to learn about others as well. Thank you. So Cheryl, can you talk a little bit about the difference of WUSAs and RAs briefly, and also talk a little bit about how does a student, like how, how what do you do when a student doesn't seem like they're engaging or making friends? Thank you, Dr. G. So we have two sets of student employees uh, within our areas, and you'll hear, we love acronyms. So RAs are resident advisors who live with your students on their floor. You've probably met them during move-in. WUSAs are Washington University Student Associates who support the students in a different way but may not live with them in their communities. And so they will be, your students will be engaging with their WUSAs this upcoming week before school starts uh, about engagement, life sessions, programming. There's a lot of co-curricular support that they offer. And they will, your student, by the end of maybe this weekend, uh, in a couple of days this week, will know their RA and WUSA by name and they will have a lot of interaction with them through meetings. Uh, these two groups support them maybe in different ways. So the WUSAs are really programmatic, co-curricular, life engagement type of support and activities. The RA also does that in, in programming, but really attends to your child in ways where if, if at two in the morning they feel like they're sick, uh, they're there to attend to them and say, here's the numbers that you need to call, here's what you should do, let me call up to my supervisor. We have RCDs, um, residential complex directors, who live, who are professional adult staff that live within the communities, and we have an RCD on call 24 seven, who is also working very closely with our Washington University Police Department, that's 24 seven, emergency services, who's 24 seven, all on site here at WashU. And so we attend to more critical issues um, that really vary from, I, I cut my finger, I do need to go to the emergency room, to uh, I, I lost my dog. You know, my dog passed away and, and I just need someone to sit here with me. And, and if there's a need to connect with any other services that my colleagues have shared, they have the resources to attend to that. The RAs moved in a week early 
uh, to attend training, and they'll also be in intense training this upcoming week, so they'll be prepared for, for situations that come their way. And, and I want to also say that the RAs do a one-on-one -on -one with every student in their residence at different points in time to really check to make sure that they are engaged with communities. And so they're watchful. So if your student is staying at, in the res hall, they're only maybe going to eat class and going back, there will, they will ask the questions and it's better from their peers to kind of say, hey, how's it going? I'd heard, you know, you're, you're not really talking to your roommates, what's going on? So, you know, we hope that through those kinds of interactions that we are able to help our students engage either at the South 40 with friends and also the clubs and organizations that is under uh, uh, Rob's and also Anthony's areas. So, speaking of Anthony's areas, um, this is not a big uh, athletic school. However, how does athletic play a role in terms of um, campus activities and campus spirits and do students get engaged with that as fans? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Um, we're moving in the right direction, to be perfectly honest with you. We try to create an environment, especially for certain games, to uh, where it's a social environment and then there's a game that breaks out, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, we really staffed up our external side of the house. Most D3 schools have sports information directors. We've been very fortunate to have uh, leadership to help us from an external point of view to kind of tie into what Dr. G as well as what the Chancellor is doing as far as in St. Louis, for St. Louis, and trying to really get youth, sports youth, uh, on our campus. Uh, and in addition to that, we've done a really good job of partnering with not only the people on this panel, uh, but really trying to meet student orgs um, wherever they're at to figure out what partnership we can do together and then really host things at sporting events. You know, when I got here, they said that was one of the top three challenges. We've uh, approached those challenges the right way to try to figure out different things that will speak to the different uh, pockets of campus to uh, get them more engaged. Uh, we're actually kicking off the volleyball scrimmage with a uh, collaboration with uh, Night at Direct, as well as there'll be uh, food trucks and fanfare uh, that evening on Friday to really kind of create this sense of community and, and belonging on this campus. And I think there's times when athletics can be the tip of the spear. Thank you. Thank you. Couple of questions. I'd like to have Kirk and Rob team up on this one. Rob, how safe is the campus and the community around? What would you say are some tips with regards to safety? Followed up by Kirk, if you can talk a little bit about resources do we have to educate students with regards to sexual assault and what supports do we have? So maybe Rob first and then Kirk. Thank you, Dr. G. So uh, the question for me is about safety, campus safety, something I think about a lot. Um, and I've been here for 24 years, and I think our campus is very safe. Uh, I'm uh, a WashU parent. My son, Jack, is uh, going to be a junior in the College of Engineering, um, and he decided on his own, this was his pink sock moment, because I wanted him to live in the residence halls, but he's living with some of his friends off campus. Uh, and I feel very comfortable about that. And I'll tell you why I feel comfortable about that. Uh, it's because we have uh, a lot of students that live in the neighborhoods around campus, a lot of faculty and staff. And so when there are a lot of people around campus, that leads to a safer environment. I will say, though, because uh, I know all of you are coming from different environments, rural, suburban, urban, this is a campus that leans a little more urban than suburban. And so you do need to take some precautions. Um, uh, Jack, my son, and I have had the conversation that nothing good ever happens between midnight and 6 a.m. And so uh, I, we take that to heart in our family. So uh, he knows that if he is out that late, he should be with friends when he's walking home to his apartment. Um, we have a really terrific police department at Washington University. You probably saw them yesterday handing out hot dogs and donuts on the South 40. They're, they're located right in the heart of the student residential area. And they have tons of great information on their website about safety, but also about crime statistics if you wanted to uh, get, get um, some information about that for yourself. And then the last thing I'll just say is Cheryl's team of resident advisors and Washington University student associates, uh, safety is something that they talk about with new students as they're coming into the university. So your students are getting that information already. And 
sexual assault is something that uh, we don't want to ever have any of our students encounter, and yet we want to be prepared for it. We have an office um, called Relationship and Sexual Violence Prevention, and that office is bifurcated in two different services. One is the treatment component, and we want to make sure that that's there for students who have suffered untoward engagement prior to arriving at WashU, during their time at WashU, off campus, wherever that may have happened. The other arm of uh, RSVP is a prevention arm, and that one's actually the much more important arm to be able to make sure that we're educating our students around issues including consent, uh, about dating practices, about uh, diversity in all its different forms. And to that end, one of the more important and profound engagements that we have early on with our students is upcoming this week, there are three, and I would call them performances, of a uh, information session called The Date. And that is put on by our RSVP, uh, well, let me say that differently. It's put on by our students who are supervised by our RSVP office. And in that educational performance, if you will, they're trying to be able to emphasize some of those components. We take very good care of and try to be very responsive between um, our RSVP office, our counseling center, and Watch You Cares in making sure that any students who have gone through something um, as significant as a sexual assault, but as minor as having a difficult engagement on in a kind of a dating relationship or other kind of things, get the service that they need. So we want to be able to address that across that full spectrum of dis difficulties that they may have encountered and make sure that they feel empowered that anything along that range is caused for them to be able to come in and seek the services that we're able to provide for them. Thank you, Kirk, for that. Um, a few questions about what are some new things that WashU has been doing or will do this coming year. Um, so I'm going to take a I'm going to take the liberty to answer that question, uh, and then my colleagues can also respond if they'd like. Um, a couple of things. The first thing is we are having launching our inaugural Bear Prince Bear Prince for Success. And that is for only first year and transfer students. And it is basically how to do college, right? It's for seven weeks. And then they're going to have like a reunion with the group and their instructor sometime during the academic year. And what it is, is when we think about college and when I talked about my mom's story, I often think one day they are with you and they have all the guardrails that you provide. And then the next day they're here with us. And we're expecting them to just know how to do college, right? That's, that's what higher education thinks that we should expect. But the reality is this is a whole new thing, right? And we're going to treat them as adults. Most of them are 18, not all. But those expectations will be there. But we want to also provide for them this unique opportunity where each week they will gain just a little bit more in their toolbox to really figure out how to academically, socially, um, healthily <laughs> engage at college and at WashU and how they will survive and thrive and succeed here. And so that's a new innovation that we have, super excited about it. You know, I know you can't make your students take it. Um, we do have a lot of them who signed up and we hope that they will. And they'll have opportunities if they didn't sign up the first seven weeks that we are offering it again at uh, the second part of the semester and also the first part of spring. I think another innovation that we have is the career in terms of the Center for Career Engagement. It is pulling them all together and is looking at students' interests and really matching it with industry, both current but also future and emerging industries that are happening. So that you could be an English major and a philosophy major and then actually want to do something innovative in business or in policy or in law and not have to think, I have to major in this to do this. Because as you know, the world is just shifted and changed and we are not in the same place. And I'm not sure we ever were, but to be a particular major. And I know everyone says, but you have to be a bio major to be a doctor. And I'm sorry, doctors, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily, right? but you can take the pre-med classes and be engaged in that as well. And anyone that's, that's in the pre-med or in the bio majors may actually not want to be a doctor, right? So this is a new innovation that we are really going to travel with your students through their time here, which is why it was important to have one centralized careers, career engagement space for them to really work with our career coaches. 
And I like to think the third innovation, and we have so many, um, we're really building up, is this concept of healthy excellence. It is about having your students come here and under really all of the folks behind me and outside of here is working with our whole community to understand what well-being can look like and how they will be healthier after they graduate from us because they will learn those tools. And so we're doing things in terms of health promotions and health education that will engage them. So their, their first call isn't necessarily, I need to see a mental health counselor, which we provide, which we provide. But maybe how do I learn the skills so that I will have a counselor, but maybe there are things that I could do like sleep and eat and have mindfulness that will lessen all of the time that I may need a counselor already. So just some innovations, talk to the folks here, they all have lots of stuff. Kirk wants to say something. Yeah, one, one thing that I'd like to add along that healthy uh, excellence line, um, one perhaps, maybe two assignments for you and, and a pro tip. One, uh, Dr. G uh, has, uh, with the chancellor's support, added something called timely care to our services here. Your students have access to that on their phones, off their computers, and I would strongly encourage you to have your students register for that now before you go home. And the registration for that uh, makes available to them some immediate um, triage for medical services, some immediate mental health for any crisis that they might find, a scheduled appointment, nutrition consultations, a bunch, a whole suite of services that they can get 24 seven. So that's really important to be able to do. Second thing, uh, kind of along a sort of a homework assignment, sort of a pro tip, is make sure your students have their insurance cards with them. Your students don't typically carry them, and so what they do carry with them is their phone. So when you're with them, have them get their insurance card, and if it's our insurance, they can print it out off the website. If it's an insurance that you have from uh, your family, hand them the insurance card and say, I need you to take a picture of this, and then stare into their soul until they do it. <laughs> Because they'll have good intentions, they'll put it in their pocket, they will really want to and mean to, and then they never will. But make sure that they take a picture of that. And then my last pro tip for you is send with them a little uh, uh, family medicine kit similar to the one that you might have at home. It should have a thermometer in it. It should have whatever your preferred medication is for flu or other kinds of things. Because they will still call you. And if they're used to taking a certain thing and you can reference the same thing you have in your medicine cabinet for them to have in their res halls, they'll feel more comfortable about that. So homework assignment and a couple pro tips along that healthy excellence line. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna do a few more speed rounds because I am we're gonna be done at 10.15, so six minutes. Few questions. So Rob, what if my student misses and oversleeps and misses class? Don't oversleep and miss class. <laughs> Thank you. It, it does happen, uh, but I, I, yeah, I don't have a good answer on that one. Time management. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. We're on it over here. Thank you, Cheryl. Quick, quick uh, response. What happens when there's snow at, at St. Louis? Um, did they take care of? Did they feed the students still? Are things open when it snows here? It doesn't snow much in St. Louis, and, and when there is snow, our operations do not stop. Um, classes even I mean there I don't even remember the last time we stopped classes but our dining halls are always open our emergency services are always open there's nothing that stops when snow comes to St. Louis and we do a great job our staff does a great job um, making sure bikes and walking paths are are clear and of course we tell students to still be careful thank you all right Danny you talked a little bit about career coaches what is a career coach so a career coach is there to support your student in navigating those career conversations. Our coaches are not going to provide all the answers or the solutions, but we're going to empower the student to support and, and move forward in their career development. Career development's a lifelong process, doesn't end uh, when they graduate, um, and it starts now. So have them come in early and often, but career coaches are there to support and, and bring uh, and bias them towards taking actions within their uh, career development process. Great. All right, Cheryl, what happens when my student doesn't contact me even though I've called, I've texted, um, and I've asked their friends to call me? <laughs> it's a I question. I think I might pass, though. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I would say that if you truly have a concern, please email us. So reslife at 
Wustl, W-U-S-T-L dot E-D-U is our general res life email. That email is checked often and always, and it's going to get routed to the right people. So please contact them. Uh, please contact me. Uh, you know, one thing that I missed when I had the question about WUSAs and RAs is, is if you can imagine a, a web, if there's something that falls on that web, whether it's breaking it or dropping on it, there's a high expectation of RAs and WUSAs and our team to understand the pulse of your student. And so just because you haven't heard from them doesn't mean that things aren't happening. It may mean that they are, uh, that we're working with them to resolve that issue and that there's not yet a need to contact you. Uh, based on what Kirk and Rob had shared, if there's a situation that rises to the level where it either will affect their enrollment, will affect their health, they're in trouble that really would need your attention, we'll be in touch with you. It, so, and we, we try our best to catch all the concerns, but if we don't, there's always an outlet for you to contact us directly. Great. All right, and I'm going to take the last one, which is there are a lot of questions about financial aid as I'm scrolling here. We encourage you to please go to student financial services for those questions. There were other some specific, very specific questions about an office. The great news is that um, these resources will actually be at the fair later today that's in your schedule. And also some of you had questions very specific about your academic deans and academic programs. And the great news, and that's why I didn't ask it, is I wanna make sure that your academic deans and their staff will have these questions um, that you can ask them. And all those sessions will start, I believe at 1045, right? Catherine and Mimi, good, I'm getting some nods from families. Um, and so we're gonna leave those because they were so specific that we wanna make sure that you get the right answers from either student financial services and or your academic deans. So with that, I would like to conclude and again, thank you all for coming. Um, I know Catherine is on her way up, but I wanna say, um, I, I like to tell my team that I, I, I remember things in threes. Um, the first thing that I wanna encourage you to remember is that we are very, we do our best to be transparent about deadlines for your students. So they're gonna call you and they're gonna say, um, I miss, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm, I can't get into housing for my second year and they didn't tell me. We're very transparent about deadlines. I always tell, sometimes I joke around with a student, but 1,805 students knew about it. So let's talk about this. <laughs> so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we believe in both supporting your students and also really looking at accountability. And so sometimes you, and for those of you who are parents, you will remember those, that we care about them, that ethos of care is strong at WashU, we provide them a lot. But there are also some hard conversations that we will have with your students. And that's okay, because that makes them be better. I myself, I was never an RA, because my um, advisor told me don't do it, because you would be fired in a week, so I get it. I've, I, I have learned from those hard conversations, so, and it turned out all right, as a Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Um, and the third thing that I wanna just say is that this is going to be, and I've shared this the last few nights with families, an exciting time. And the students and their families and their counselors from their high schools and everyone will put so much and say that this is going to be the best four years of your, their lives. And um, newsflash, it will not be because there should be many, many best years of their lives and best moments of their lives. But what we can tell you is this is going to be a great and a good experience and the learning and the growth experience for your student. And that I can promise. I will never promise that this will be the best years of their lives, but this is going to count as amazing learning growth years of their lives. So thank you. Welcome to WashU. And thank you so much for being a part of our family.
Hi, good morning. As Dr. Gonzalez said, my name is Catherine Pay, and I work in student transitions and family programs. As many of my colleagues have already said, welcome to you and your student to WashU. So the next event is the dean's meetings for the academic schools for families. Your students are still in other required meetings. They will not be joining you at this time, um, but they will be available after your dean's meeting. So I'm gonna release you all um, one by one to go to your next location based on the academic division that your student is in. And in the back of the room, we have some student employees with these very large red signs um, that will indicate where you're going, and you'll follow them to your dean's meetings. So before I start releasing you all, I want to say that if you have a student in Beyond Boundaries, you can attend any dean's meeting of your choosing. You may want to consider the one that your student is most heavily leaning towards for their sophomore year. And if your student is in a joint program such as business and computer science, you could choose to attend either McKelvey Engineering or Olin Business. It's up to you. So arts and sciences families, you're going to stay in here. You're the majority. You were not moving, so you're going to stay right where you're seated. Um, families of Sam Fox students, so if your student is studying architecture or art, you're going to head to Steinberg Hall so you can step